You are listening to Animated Indulgence, the explicit and opinionated podcast where grown men talk about cartoons. Each episode, we'll pick apart, analyze, and dissect an animated series or movie. Warning, there will be spoilers, even potentially for shows and movies that are not the topic at hand. We may watch cartoons, but we don't watch our language. Discretion is advised. Welcome, listeners, to Animated Indulgence, where grown men watch cartoons. I am Airhammer. I'm Deus. And I'm Adrork. And today we are going to be shifting gears a little bit into some edutainment with the Magic School Bus. This has been indifferent for most of us. I'm okay with it. Days is not that much into it. <laughs> yeah, Would you like to I'm elaborate? Well, Suddenly in the middle as well. Normally we do a spoiler-free section, but there's really no spoilers to be had here. It's simply a, a show about a teacher who has magic and teaches science to elementary school children. She is moderately irresponsible, but considering she has magic, she's probably got it covered and we just don't know. So there's not much spoilers to be had. It's very episodic. It follows the same teacher in the same class in every episode. There's very little to add here before we get into it. So should we go on to expectations right away? Actually, before we get too bit into our expectations, you want to? Do you have any info on the sh the show? Uh, oh so yeah, I've got a whole history thing here. Yeah. So yeah, the the Magic School Bus. It started out as a book series in 1986, made by Scholastic, and eventually, about eight years later, they turned it into a television cartoon series. Overall, there were 106 books about 37 videos that they produced, and later on, 33 DVDs. They even came out with about 15 video games, which was pretty impressive for the show itself. Many of the books, if not all the books that came out prior to the cartoon, were all adapted into cartoon episodes. The series premiered on September 10th of 1994, and very impressive for the show, it went 52 episodes over four seasons, ending in December of 97. Uh, so does that mark our transition into expectations? Okay. Uh, yeah, so with that, we could just jump right into expectations, I guess. As I've seen some of this as a kid, I kind of know what to expect. It's a magical, kind of episodic, educational show. I remember it was memories. I won't say necessarily fond, because I wasn't very particularly fond of the show. But I have memories of like it being wheeled out on like one of those fucking carts, on, like a fucking CRT TV on it, when I was in elementary school. When it and put it into a VCR or DVD player, and watching it. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I know what to expect. It's cheesy, semi-educational kids programming. Deus. What do you expect? I don't want to do this, man. Why do you make me do this? <laughs> I don't expect anything good out of this, to be honest. I've not seen any of this. I've seen a few clips here and there changing channels when I was younger. It looks pretty bad, and hopefully what I get is something better than the sum of its parts. I expect a highly episodic show based around a quirky cast of characters, more character-driven, not narrative-driven at all. I'm fairly sure these episodes are entirely interchangeable with no continuity. I know I was a fan of some PBS programming when I was younger, and this did not click with me. It didn't resonate with me right away, so hopefully it was just an error in bad first impressions, but I think this is going to give Yu-Gi-Oh! a run for its money. I think this is going to be really bad. <laughs> I've seen the entire series at least once. came out when I was 11, so yeah, I basically know my expectations. It's full of bad puns, lots of catchphrases, but in its tone, it is educational. I can remember in my early teens that the show actually did kind of help me with a couple of homework assignments here and there. Some of the characters simply aren't likable on their attitude, and I'm expecting a rewatch to be somewhat similar. Even to this day, there will be the odd channel that might be doing reruns, and I hear that there's a remake coming soon. As a oh. side note, I'm expecting there to be some inaccuracies in the stuff being taught. It is I think there are, stuff, yeah. Time has progressed, so I'm going to try and keep an eye out for those. That will probably be in my notes. One yeah. other thing I would like to say in my expectations, I expect ethnic diversity 
to be painfully obvious, I, I'm expecting planet here level in diversity. <laughs> I'm expecting it to yes. be bludgeoned on my psyche. So, yeah, that's one thing I expect. Yeah, I already, like I said, I don't have the most vivid memories of the show, but I know that's there. Do I have to do a digibash of Ms. Frizzle as Captain Planet now? Yes. Yes, you do. Yes. Yes, I do. I don't Okay. <laughs> I remember I expected pain and suffering from this one. <laughs> I was not expecting much. I expected to absolutely hate it. And to be fair, I don't hate it. It was a little better than I expected. The effort shows, but I have no love for it. I don't like this either. I can see what they did and what they were trying to do. It just didn't rise up to the task, in my opinion. I like this in no way, shape, or form. I just, I'm not passionate enough to hate it. I've already done my review of Yu-Gi-Oh! I hated that show. It spat in my face frequently. <laughs> it went contrary to what common sense and good storytelling often do. This show had objectives and goals, and it followed them fairly well. It just did not make an entertaining product out of it for me. Yeah, for me, I just listened to my expectations back uh, myself, and yeah, I wasn't expecting all that much because I had seen it before, and it pretty much held true to what I remember seeing. I used to watch it. You remember those old TV cart things they roll out at school? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys ever had that, but yeah, that's one of the various things that they would play from time to time on that. And I guess it falls right where I remember it. It's a little cheesy educational show. I, exactly what I expected. Pretty much the same for me, exactly as I remember it. The kids were just as cringy with all of their catchphrases and such. Nothing that really stood out as any different to me. I still remember everything that I'd learned from the show back when I was a kid. So, yeah, mm -hmm. the show's okay. <laughs> So I'd like to note now that I am a little older than you guys. I was in middle school when this came out, I think, or either very late elementary. I don't remember exactly. But I never really had this in school. So for me, there are absolutely no memories attached to it. It was a show that was on, but I always avoided it. I would rather watch entertaining television while I was younger. For me, it was painfully boring. So I feel like it must have missed at least part of the target audience in some ways, because if there were any kids that were a bit more mature for their age, they would have passed on this as well. For me, this was not a pleasant viewing, but I wasn't banging my head against the table. It felt very much like work. Well, I was 11 when the show came out, and I was an avid viewer of PBS at the time, checking out, you know, a variety of programs like Carmen San Diego and Square One and stuff like that. So when this hit, I did find it entertaining, even though I did find the kids annoying. And I was learning something. Even as the show hit syndication later on when I was in high school, I was still finding aspects of the teaching helpful to what I was doing. Like I, I might be doing a particular piece of homework and all of a sudden here came a Magic School Bus episode and I would learn something that was relevant to what I was doing. So I was kind of happy that it was around. Well, I'm glad it helped someone. But I can see where you're coming from. Uh, it all has to do with demographic and timing, for example, and this would come up in a later sidecast in that, say, Power Rangers, for example, you know, like I was 10 years old or 9, 10 years old when that show came out. And a lot of people that were in my class at school felt that they were already outgrowing that type of thing or they just flat out found it stupid yeah. to begin with. This this, um, this type of thing happens in everything. Look at Pokemon. Like, yes, there is like, a thin line example. between like being the biggest Pokemon fan ever in existence. Like, there's a, like, a generation of kids that were like, Pokemon is everything to these kids, right? Pokemon mm -hmm. games, Pokemon plushies, Pokemon TV show, Pokemon cards, Pokemon pogs, Pokemon fucking everything that existed, Pokemon <laughs> had it, right? And it meant everything yep. to these kids. But if you were just two years older, what the, what, what the fuck, man? Pokemon... What the fuck? You know? Like, they, they <laughs> exactly. Don't, it, it, that's, that's how thin the line is at times. I wonder if Magic School Bus, for us, fits into that. You know, Deus, you're just slightly on the other side of the line. You old fart. Uh, it seems that way. <laughs> I'm not certain that nostalgia would have made this much more pleasant for me, though. As I said, the viewing was very much a chore. It was very boring to watch. Yeah, I suspect enough. anyone with nostalgia for it could probably scratch that itch with a single episode. I agree. Yeah, probably. Want to move on? Usually uh, we cover plot, yeah. but really... There isn't much to talk about that. there, so we'll kind of go through it quickly if we haven't already. There are some so, common no. threads. There are things that yeah. happen in most episodes. It's very episodic, but it follows a formula. 
some sort of predicament or situation arises and the class takes a field trip which involves taking the bus somewhere usually shrinking down it shrinks quite often and engaging with the science that goes on by using the magic it's kind of a weird concept to me using magic to teach science, but I do appreciate science, so I can certainly respect that. I wish they would have taught the lessons a bit more engaging, but having, what, 22 minutes to go through, set up a premise, find a way to teach a lesson, and resolve the premise is pretty tight. So they don't always get the opportunity to make it exciting. One of the major things I noted was that, as far as I am aware, most educational shows like to do learning by repetition. And this show, while it does it at times, doesn't do it nearly as bad. It treats the kid viewers a little bit better. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not meant for really, really young kids. It's not like a Dora Explorer or Blues to Clues. I just thought that it's interesting that it doesn't follow that formula as much because it's aimed at an you know, older audience. Yeah, I could see that. I could see it being aimed at, I don't know, seven to nine-year-olds. Certainly not preschoolers. This fits more in with, like, I know they're not cartoons, but it feels more with, like, Bill Nye than Dora the Explorer or Blue's Clues or Gully Gully Island. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit in plot, but it definitely frames the show well, so I think that's a good point to put here. Warning, the spoiler-free section is now over. Continue listening at your own risk. So, we are talking about a show that's not super dumbed down. There are plenty of TV shows out there aimed at 79-year-olds that are engaging. So, I think it stands to reason that this one isn't a complete disaster. I think what we're looking at within the plot is sometimes preposterous things happen. Sometimes very predictable problems occur. Sometimes unpredictable things happen. I, for me, when the unpredictable problems occur is when the show is most entertaining. When you couldn't see it coming a mile away is when the show is at its best. I think sometimes the ham-fisted storytelling wears on me quicker than it would the target audience, but I don't know that even they would have the patience for it. Oh, not nowadays. I think kids nowadays have a different mindset when it comes to TV, right? Because it's all on demand. Yeah, well, why should they sit there and wait through an entire show to get to the good part when they could pick up their phone and start doing something else engaging? Yeah, exactly. I think educational series and things that are going to be aimed at kids like that are just going to be done differently from, you know, here going out. Well, I think there's some common threads that happen over and over again. I've mentioned the basic beats of most stories. I mentioned that they shrink very, very often. They do shrink a lot. They, They could have gotten away with calling this the magical shrinking school bus and it would have been fine. Miss Frizzle, the teacher, rarely seems like she has a plan, but always acts with such a confidence that you sort of know that she knows what's going on regardless. She is a very interesting character, though I could understand if sometimes the kids felt more scared or traumatized than they had reason to, because she just sort of lets them out there and get loose. Part of her motto is to take chances, make mistakes, and get messy, and while it's a great motto, it doesn't do so well when you're a child whose life feels like they're endangered, so I can't even imagine the psychological trauma these poor kids have gone through. It's a great quote, but you have to put it in context. There's a difference between take chances, make mistakes, get messy when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and nothing between you and fucking drowning to death and in your bedroom (laughs) fucking exploring with your toys. Context matters. Yeah, or when you've become a frog and you're being hunted down by a crocodile in a river or something. (laughs) (laughs) Because that sort of thing happens in this show. All the time. And Miss Frizzle is always super chill and very happy about it. So to me, I feel like her attitude throughout the show is also something that is definitely a common thread, part of the plot, part of the fingerprint the show brings. Because every time you see this show, I, I think I've only seen Frizzle panic once or twice in all the episodes I've seen. She never loses her cool. So I feel like her personality, her attitude towards things brings so much to the show that it's sort of part of how the episodes play out in general. The kids yeah. don't go relying on Miss Frizzle to help because half the time they talk to Miss Frizzle and she changes the problem from one to another. She advances things. It always enhances their understanding of the issue, but she is not there to babysit them, to coddle them, or to make their problems go away. If they're about to be eaten by some kind of bird because she turned them all into bugs, she'll turn them into birds instead 
and then they'll be attacked by a cat. <laughs> Circle of life. Uh-huh. Yep. And that's the lesson. That's the lesson for the episode. Circle of life. Everything's got predators. Oh, and they'll except, hear that or she would allow them to be eaten, and then now they're still okay. You know, like when they yeah. got liquefied. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> this can't be a pleasant experience to be turned into liquid. Well, to be honest, Arnold was the only one that was ever troubled by these field trips. Everyone else was so accepting of it, and he just wanted to go home. We've kind of dipped into it. You want to talk about characters? Yeah, casting characters here. Uh, where to start? Obviously with Miss Frizzle, or maybe we should leave her to the end. We can go in any order, but since we're already on Arnold, let's start with Arnold. He's a little redhead with glasses, striped shirt, always feels like he should have stayed home that day, and he just hates the entire concept of Frizzle's variation of a field trip because it always involves the magic and getting into danger, and the guy has to have some kind of stress. He's the worry wart of the group. He's just stresses about everything, he dislikes the idea of ever actually doing anything remotely dangerous and exciting. He's the party pooper with PTSD, yeah. Arnold had two voice actors throughout the show's run. The first, I believe, was Danny Tamborelli. Yes, all that. I did not recognize him. Holy shit. If you've ever seen the original Mighty Ducks movie, he was Tommy. He's the little brother of whatever girl from the, the kids' class. He doesn't do a whole lot. He doesn't show up in any of the sequels. He's just there for that film. He doesn't get a whole lot of screen time, but he's there. So if you ever see Tommy again in, that, in the Mighty Ducks, that's Arnold number one. And he was also Pete and Pete. He was one of the Pete's. Uh -huh. Pete. I like Pete and Pete much better than this show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know that much about Pete and Pete, other than Danny Temporelli was a, one of the Pete's. Arnold number two is played by Amos Crawley. I guess some people will know him as Kite on Beyblade. And Amos was also one of three of the child actors on this show that was also on Babar. He played Alexander. Next up, let's do Ralphie. He's into baseball. There's not a whole lot to say about but him, really. Like That's one thing about the characters in this show, and is that they are all so shoehorned into like one or two few things. Ralphie's the kid that likes sports. Carlos is the head that cracks puns. What else you know what, you're talking? absolutely right. That's actually the only note I really have about the characters. All the kids are the same kid, but with quirks. Him is bland and likable. Arnold's wimpy with a catchphrase that he should have stayed home. Carlos has bad jokes. Ralphie's the jock. Dorothy's the bookworm. Phoebe is a SJW that cares about her <laughs> old school more than her current school. Juan is a worrywart with a catchphrase. He's just painfully forgettable. Mikey is a prodigy and a paragon of virtue who just can't do any wrong. Jenna is just a plain bitch. I'm pretty much done with this segment until we get to Miss Frizzle. Later, guys. Okay. Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, Ralphie's just a sports kid. He wears a red hat. He's got a green shirt with a big R on it. His mother's a doctor, and he's kind of uh, maybe a tad sexist a little bit here and there, and maybe an episode or two, but that's really the only thing I really get out of him. He doesn't have much of a catchphrase like the others. He's just there. He's there because they needed he, a job, and that was it. Pretty much. He's voiced by Stuart Stone, who was another one of the Babar kids. He played Arthur. And then maybe those who have seen X-Men, the original cartoon from the 90s, he played young Charles Xavier in one episode and Proteus. I haven't seen it, but I will. Stuart has actually gone on to become the producer of the Magic School Bus sequel, which is out now, which is kind of cool. Huh. That is kind of neat. Next we have Wanda. She's annoying. That's the best I can put it. Well, she, she is the annoying her character. Was, oh no! Oh no! Oh no! We're, we have what are we gonna do? And she just repeats this. And then she has you what bunch of Weasley do? wimps. She has enough catchphrases. Uh, she's, she's normally she's the most. She's like a bully kind of too. Doesn't she like? She's she's the one. She's a little bullyish. I would also say she's the most adventurous, but that normally gets her into trouble. Like, yeah. the second episode, she is trying to have Arnold break a record for her so that she can get tickets to an amusement park ride that's designed to look like the digestive system, which, you know, coincidentally has to do with the theme of the episode itself. But the fact that she's making Arnold do it instead of doing it herself, so there comes the bullying. And then she is so excited later on in the episode to be riding through his bowels <laughs> because he's just as good as the ride that she would have been on otherwise. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, I'm trying to balance on top of a big piece of bubble gum in his sphincter. Wanda's voiced by Lisa Jai. She was the third of the Babar troop playing Isabel. Next up, I guess, would be Phoebe. And yeah, as you already covered, at my old school, <laughs> which is her common catchphrase, she is so obsessed with talking about what she did at her old school instead of just getting adapting to her new school. 
I hate her hairstyle. I have always hated that hairstyle on girls. It, my, it you know, it's short, straight with the little curl on the side. My uh, <laughs> my question is like, what did they do at her old school? At my old school, the we office? never did this. At my old school, we never did. At my old school, we never. At my, you know, that's yeah. all you ever hear for <laughs> from her. What did I, they I do at her they, old school? At my I old school, we sat in nor- our room and did nothing until the bell rang and left. I, I guess that's the whole thing. They were normal. <laughs> they were the average well, even kid. Normal. Even um, normal schools. Yeah, like my best line for her comes from the construction episode where she's like, at, at my old school, we were never allowed to walk across the toilet. <laughs> she always just says the outlandish things. They were just normal kids. She's voiced by Maya Vilar. I, I probably have that pronounced wrong. She didn't do a whole lot afterward. However, if anyone is familiar with the show Food Factory from Food Network, she writes for that program, or at least she used to. So that was interesting. Next character I want to bring up is Carlos. Carlos' entire existence seems to be just to make puns that everyone gets angry at him for, even though everyone else in the show puns. Carlos will come up with at least one pun per episode, but then he has his moments where, such as the ant episode, pretty much every line ends with a Carlos pun, which is just really, really bad. But fun. I I enjoyed that episode, actually. But yeah, he's the king of bad puns for this show. He's voiced by Daniel DeSanto. He plays Ray on Beyblade. You might remember him as Tucker on Are You Afraid of the Dark? And if you've seen the movie Mean Girls, he plays Jason. If you don't recall who that character is, he's the guy that comes up to Lindsay Lohan and he's like, would you like someone to butter your muffin? (laughs) He shows up a few other times in the movie, but yeah, if you see him, that's Carlos. Carlos wants to butter Lindsay Lohan's muffin. Yeah, I'm sure he did. (laughs) From what I recall of the movie's trivia, the actual line was pop your cherry and they changed it to butter your muffin. But yeah, we're getting off context. (laughs) That's pretty low bar. I'm sure he managed. Oh, wow. Well, it's Lindsay Lohan. Someone had been there before. (laughs) So the interesting thing about Carlos as well, most of his jokes are puns. He sort of has the character trait of just being a goofball entertainer, the class clown, so to speak. I know in one episode he did uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. <laughs> so jokes in general are a shtick. Just I feel like the writers didn't have good jokes and settled on puns. His jokey nature reminds me of Brock and Pokemon. So next up, I guess, would be our not as Dorothy. successful characters. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with Dorothy Ann. She is the bookworm of the group. She's blonde with pigtails. According to my research. I, according to my research, yeah. So here's the big thing about Dorothy Ann in that she seems like she's the character that knows everything. But in reality, she doesn't know it until the problem comes up and she researches it at that specific moment. So you take, like, she the very first episode. She loves Wikipedia. She's that person. She like, loves Wikipedia. That, like, always, like... Everyone in the room's like, oh, I don't. I wonder what that's about. And then she knows 30 seconds later because she got out her phone on Wikipedia. Did. Yeah, so you take, like, the f- very first episode where they're studying the planets. The kids act like they have no idea what planets there are in the solar system, even though they've been setting it up and studying it for how long. And then you've got Janet, who we'll bring up later, who's always gloating about the A that she got on her science report regarding the planets. But then here you have Dorothy Ann, who is giving the impression that she knows just as much as Janet, but doesn't know anything just as much as the other kids until they start asking questions because now she's just about to do her research i don't know the character's annoying to me yeah i think everyone knows that dorothy ann in real life she's voiced by tara mayer who uh, sadly uh, did not do anything post 2000 she had only a few minor roles outside of the magic school bus and that was it Next up would be Tim, who has to be the most normal kid of the entire class. He likes making things. He built a model plane once, and then he's just kind of there, even more so than Ralphie. At least Ralphie has this thing of liking sports. Tim draws. That's what his thing is. He draws. He's basically the artist of the group. He doesn't really have a catchphrase, so to speak, but he has been known to say, you know, we've been frizzled, something like that. So I guess he's got something to him. Like Arnold, he also had two voice actors, Andre Otley and Max Beckford. However, they basically did nothing outside of playing Tim. Not a very prestigious role. Let's see, rounding out the kids then, our final one would be Keisha. There's not a whole lot to say about Keisha either outside of her catchphrase. She probably had the most out of all the kids. Let me get the facts, and then, oh, bad, oh, bad, 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 Uh, bad, bad. Yeah, obnoxious. Again, just another character that's kind of there. 
So, yeah. I got a question for you guys. This one's going to tiptoe onto something that might be a little difficult to get in the podcast, but I want to ask because it's a thought that occurred to me. So, we both agree that Tim and Keisha are the most bland characters that they wrote, right? Uh-huh. We well, all agree on that. Is anyone more bland than them? I want to say bland to more average to normal to, you know, not as hyper as all the others. But, yeah, I guess we could say that, yeah. I guess what I'd say is they have less defining attributes compared to other characters as far as we know. Yeah. Fair, fair. That's actually a very good way to put it. Do you think that they have less defining attributes because the writers were afraid to write African-American children in any niche role? Because those two are the only two African-American kids in the show. They're the only two black kids there. Yeah. And they are very middling. They don't have any real traits, so to speak of. I am somewhat concerned that the producers, the writers, were just afraid to take a risk on that one. And I feel like some of those characters may have been denied some real position as some real ability to stand out because yeah, maybe. of that at the same time they, they definitely needed more defining traits i can't say all i know is that i watched a moderate sample size of this show's episodes and i don't feel like those characters really got defined well and if i was a kid watching on tv not watching every single day missing some episodes catching an in syndication that's not too far off from what i would have seen Fair those enough. characters weren't really represented super well and i would have loved to see them get something that make them stand out because tim is my favorite of the kids i like tim the way they presented him was made him likable he's just really bland Uh, he's also my favorite before we forget what was the last kid's voice actress keisha's my favorite out of all the actors because she's played by erica luttrell who is the voice of sapphire on steven universe yeah it's pretty cool and when i realized that it was neat and that's why i wanted to bring it back I guess we could mention Liz, although she has no voice of any kind. So Liz is a lizard, obviously, that lives with Ms. Frizzle, and she's basically the class pet. And from what we've seen of only one episode, occasionally one of the kids will take Liz for a weekend at home, which is rather interesting. It's nothing that we actually see in the show, we just hear about it. Very intelligent. She's a highly intelligent lizard that is capable of driving a bus and understanding English. And working various mechanisms and whatever, mm-hmm. what have you. She's Confident. a small, green, scaly, mute teacher's assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, rounding out, we have Ms. Valerie Frizzle, played by Lily Tomlin. And boy, does she do a good job. <laughs> she even comes back for the sequel, take back the role, uh, even though she's not a major character in the sequel, but she does come back, so that's neat. For those that are not familiar with Lily Tomlin, look her up. She came to fame through Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, playing Ernstein, the telephone operator. She's currently on a show called Grace and Frankie, if you can find it. But yeah, her main thing is comedy, and she's got a rather iconic voice, and she just does so well as Frizzle. She's the most iconic, or second most iconic character of the show in my book. She kind of brings the life to the whole show. She's the main instigator of everything. She might not be the titular character, but she... None of the show would happen without her, right? She is the instigator of everything that happens in every episode and everything Magic School Bus, at least the original show. Uh, maybe not direct right. instigator, but, like, a problem occurs. Now the show is, quote-unquote, interesting. And I know you would debate that, the, <laughs> this, but she... Stuff is happening because of her. Instead of just having a rotten fucking piece of food in her classroom, now they're going to a, a Magic field trip inside the food to see it rot or whatever she's the one that makes stuff happen she's the biggest instigator of the entire show the show would be nothing without her i agree miss frizzle is the standout to me i don't think that the show would be even uh, close to what it is without her if you put any other character in there i don't know if they would have worked well, she as carried well as the her. show let's, is... put, let's be honest well, Tomlin's performance aside, I feel like the character herself fits perfectly into that role as well. Miss Frizzle is whimsical. She's flighty. She is never worried. She's such a weird and wonderful character. She's the only thing about the show that actually stood out to me as interesting in any way. Tomlin's performance enhanced it for sure, but the character herself is definitely a standout for me from the show. When Miss Frizzle's on the screen doing stuff, it's a huge shakeup to what's going on within the narrative of the episode. She has drastic impacts on what the kids are doing and how they're engaging with the problem. And I think that's it just speaks so much to the importance of the character and how the character is portrayed, how she's characterized, that she lets things happen and doesn't try to shelter the kids too much. I mentioned before that she is grossly irresponsible. She is, but at the same time, she's not overly worried or sheltering either. 
her confidence sort of beams forth and makes you feel like the kids are safe as if she's got things under control and they just don't realize it yeah i think that's for sure what's going on she like I said, she's a sorceress, genie, magical being thing. Something happened. It's some horrible accident. One of those rocks that they're dropping on the Ferris wheel slipped and fucking crushed a kid underneath it. She's a snap her fingers. Yeah, no, she's probably no, Actually, what would happen is like, oh, here's a lesson on what happens when bones crush. <laughs> yeah, she'd probably teach the rest of the class and then rewind time. Arnold comes back and's like, wait, you were in my corpse? <laughs> oh, Arnold, you've died 50 times this semester. <laughs> Just wait till summer break when I'm not around to protect you. To be honest, when you do watch this show, the kids should have died like ten times over every season. So it's possible that she did go back in time to do that. Who knows? She has a themed dress for pretty much every episode. There will be something on her clothing that has to do with the lesson at hand. The ants episode, she Um, has ants. The the rain cycle one, she had various rain-themed things on her dress. Yeah, clouds and water droplets. I think there's an umbrella too or something like that. When Ralphie was sick, she had, like, a needle on her dress and pills. Thermometer. <laughs> Thermometer, yep. She has, as my insert relative or acquaintance or something here used to say, insert random nonsensical quote that doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, she definitely has her own catchphrases. She'll always point out that somebody, so-and-so, whether it's just ridiculous historical figure or family member or so forth, as Blank used to say, or as I always say, she's always known to say excellent observation. I'd like to point out the family member in question always has a name that is a pun as well. Yes, like opportunity. I'm sure Oprah Winfrey owns the copyright on that now. <laughs> there were some episodes where we, we didn't watch these things, but you'll see people in these episodes that have puns for names. So Molly Kuehl was one, and then there was one particular mechanic. I believe his name was Radius Ulna Humorous. I think that is his actual name in the show. I think that's just the, <laughs> the nature of the show itself, though. I mean, it might have to do with people she knows, but like the, yeah. the principal's name is Mr. Rules. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it's mm-hmm. just the nature of this universe. If you're not a child in Miss Frizzle's class, your name's probably going to have a pun. Does um, help explain Carlos, though. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Even with the bus, you know. Speaking of, uh, the last she, character. She will, the last character. That was uh, who I was leading up to as the final character. I think the bus uh, should be mentioned as a character. This bus is alive. Its headlights act as eyes. Its grill is kind of a mouth. And it, it clearly shows that it has its own sentience and intelligence. Yeah, and it responds to people, you know, asking stuff of it. It has facial expressions. You could tell when, it, like, something bad happens to the bus and something's wrong with the bus. They get beat up and worried looking. I'd argue that it's not actually a character because it doesn't have any personality or character growth or any real traits. It simply has expressions. It is semi-sentient. I don't know. It's, it edges a line in my head. It, it's right on the um. border. We don't really know what the bus is made out of. There are some episodes where Miss Frizzle will be talking about various parts that she needs, one of which is like the mesmer globber. When it comes to the mechanics of the bus, we have no idea what's in that thing, but whatever it is, it does its job. It's bigger on the inside than the outside. It has the power to shrink. It can turn itself into various animals. It can launch itself into space. It can go to the depths of the ocean. It could survive lava. It could go inside of a human being. It could, it could literally do anything. It can become a planet with its own orbit. Is it magical or is Frizzle magical? Because a lot of times Frizzle just pulls out some, like, shrink ray herself yeah, that's a good point. maybe it's an extension of just frizzle maybe it's it's hard to explain but i think we can maybe bring it up in a segment in a moment we have janet she's basically the antagonist of the show arnold's cousin goes to a d- different school looks just like him but female and wearing a skirt and she has a j on her shirt same style shirt too yellow and white stripes she normally likes to gloat about her grades or how much better her school is. She finds Miss Frizzle to be incredibly bizarre. And in the first episode, when they go out into space, Prove it. she she attempts to bring home all of this space junk and variety of other things to explain, oh yeah, I just went up into space. And yeah, in the end, they just drop it all off on Pluto and go back after Arnold kills himself. It's gonna really confuse the future-like <laughs> astronauts. Actually, in the producer bit after the episode, there's a joke about aliens supposedly calling the producer about Splitter on Pluto. 
yeah, I guess we can go into that segment next. So, oh, um, we haven't even talked about Mikey. Right. Mikey. Do I have to? Yes, I have to rant about Mikey. Mikey is Carlos's younger, disabled brother. Oh, yeah. That's right. Who, oh, who yeah. travels around in the most high tech wheelchair you will ever see in your life. How he got this wheelchair, I don't know. This thing's too powerful. He can fly with it. It has a built in hydrofoil. If you name it, it's probably built into that thing. He probably just had a regular <laughs> wheelchair until his brother happened to make it into fucking Mrs. Frizzle's class and then <laughs> got him hooked up. I don't know. Mikey, he's portrayed as a technological genius. He's portrayed as extremely altruistic. He's basically the spirit of Superman, where he's always happy to help and wants to do the very best job he can, but in the body of a boy whose legs don't work. And for being that intelligent, you're kind of surprised he hasn't been skipped ahead of Carlos. He's also incredibly powerful in that, in the episode about the Ferris wheel, which we're going to go into here in a bit, he is actually capable of doing the whole uh, strength test, where he actually makes the bell fly right off the machine. Hey, when your legs don't work... All that upper forever. body power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at Joe Swanson. Time to move on? Um, the producer segment. Yeah. So, depending on what variation of the show that you're watching, whether it's the original or the syndication, if you're looking at the original episode, there will be a segment after the main program that will start up with a whole bunch of kids from around the world calling up the Magic School Bus. And then we are introduced to the producer of the show, voiced by Malcolm Jamal Warner, who played there's Theo actually, Huxtable on the comic fe- show. There's a female producer as well. I yeah, think. occasionally you might see somebody else in the segment but this male male producer is typically the one you'll see and he'll be hanging out with liz and this is an interesting segment in that it shows that it's outside the fourth wall is what it is yeah it's like it makes it seem like the magic school bus is a program within a program no it doesn't even it's not even that much it flat out acknowledges that the magic school bus is a tv show and that it's not quite in our world because Liz is still magical and intelligent. You normally see this producer or the other one, or you might get one of the other characters, such as Mr. Sinew from one episode. And the thing is, when these characters are taking the phone calls in the segment, they are still playing their role. Or so Phoebe will still be Phoebe and so forth. But then at the same time, it's like Liz is played up more like she's the production's pet. She's just an animal actor. Yeah, it's all It's a very weird. confusing segment. Out of continuity place. If it had continuity, this would be out of it. The producer segment is actually very really interesting to me because you mentioned it was cut from the PBS airing. Any channel that aired it with commercials would take out the producer segment. Exactly. So they took out the producer yeah. segment to make room for commercials. And in my opinion, I know Deus probably disagrees, but then again, Deus only saw one of them, I think. Mm -hmm. I didn't know these existed until you guys brought it up because they were simply cut. There was no indication they would ever have been there. Mm-hmm. They were completely cut yeah. for commercial time in the syndicated version. I think it adds something to the show. It makes the show a little bit different. I don't think it drastically changes it, but I think it's a shame that they're cut and removed. It's part of the show. It'd be like I'm on the other side of that fence. I do think it's a shame that content isn't available, but I think it's a shame that they rely too heavily on those little segments at the end to explain away so many problems. Whether it be scientific inaccuracies, exaggerations for the sake of education, or even just plot holes or issues with the plot and story of the episode, none of this should be in a segment after the show. It should have been incorporated within the show. You could have cut one of Carlos's jokes. You could have cut some of Phoebe and Tim arguing or something. All that stuff doesn't matter. If you would have got to the meat of the episode and explained things better, had a better plot, you won't need the producer segment to prop it up. They use it as a tool to make things simpler to tell a story a kid can digest. I think it is very much a shortcut tool. I maybe, guess it makes it but really I, I don't like it when it shows cut corners, so maybe that's why I dislike that. But on principle, I don't specifically like it. I would have much rather had them talk to actual children about the lesson and use the producer segment to give other examples of things that were taught and clarify things. They do go into more details about, like, we talked about this, but did you know also this, this, and this? Then it makes me happy that they did at least some of them right. I just wish they would have not used it as a writing shortcut. Even if it was the worst, (laughs) have it cut for advertising is unfortunate. 
Well, I guess when it comes to the cast, the only other thing to really bring up is the guest voices. We don't really have to go into detail here, but when it comes to getting celebrities and such for this show, they were really good at it. And there is someone almost every episode. Among others, we had Malcolm McDowell, Wyona Judd, Sherman Helmsley, Michael York, Carol Channing, Dom DeLuise, Ed Asner, Alex Trebek, Dolly Parton, Eartha Kitt, Tony Randall, Elliot Gould, Dan Marino, Ed Begley Jr., and Tom Cruise. And there's more than just those. Even Susan Blue, who is the voice director for the show, and she's done voice directing for many programs. We always know her as Arcee on Transformers. She had a couple of speaking roles in some episodes. I named the next section Errors and Rants. Anything you want to bring up there? I did have errors, a scientific error. The big obvious okay. one is Pluto. That's been since, yes. since. But then again, it's on the edge because it wasn't an error when this aired, right? Yeah. Um, the other one that I noticed and I checked up and did a side research on, they, they talk several times, at least in the sample episodes we watched, about the states of matter. And it was never really brought up in the producer segments or anything, as far as I'm aware. They just skip one of the states of matter. They talk about liquids, gas, solids, but they don't never talk about plasma. It's a state of matter. What kind of stuff did you guys see? Not as much on the error end for me, more on the rants. Anything that stood out error-wise for you, though, days before we go on to rants? I saw a lot of little errors, but I could tell they were sort of glossed over for the sake of storytelling, for the sake of getting to the point of the lesson. And in fact, yeah. that's one of the biggest themes I saw, is that all the errors that really jumped out at me were for the sake of the episode writing, and not just because they were blatant mistakes. Exactly. There were quite a few things that jumped out at me as, oh, well, they could have said that, they should have said that. But then I realized, well, none of this matters because she's got magic. Of course the planet's growing fast. She's freaking magical. Everything I could say, everything I could rant about, everything that I would have been upset about normally, is just, well, there's magic involved, so I have no nothing to stand on. I guess I have one rant, but it doesn't have anything to do with anything within the show. It has to do with the bizarreness of the continuity. So I, yeah. I don't know. I don't really have anything to point out as far as errors go. Because yeah, I definitely thought there would be more. The nature of them. Otherwise, you will hear some continuity between episodes as they are remembering something that they've done in the past. Yeah, exactly. We're going to go into Arnold's body again. Remember that time we did it before? Again, yep. So, ranting now, and I have a lot of it, so maybe you guys should go first. No, go not, ahead. You guys sure. go first. I, I got one thing to rant I'm about. I'm not sure though. I have anything to really, really rant about. Like, I didn't love the show, but I didn't. nothing stood out at me as being so wrong that I have to be passionately upset about it. I'm curious what you guys have, though. Well, I wouldn't really say upset, just that I picked out a lot of stuff that I felt I had to nitpick about. So, looking again at the first episode, toward the end, as Janet is complaining about not being able to go back to Earth with all the crap she's been collecting, Arnold takes off his helmet, and it immediately turns into this massive ice cube wearing glasses. And uh, Like I said, Arnold has died. Arnold like... has died so <laughs> often on this show. And I, yeah, I, even, I tweeted out about that, I think. We're always going on about, if you need something to ex be explained in this show, magic did it. And so they managed to bring Arnold back to Earth, thaw out his head, and all he's got after all that is a little cold. He was only exposed to the vacuum for a brief time. Sure, he would have been injured. Maybe his eyes would have freeze-dried and he would be blind. But I don't know if it would have flat-out killed him, because they got him back into a warm, pressurized environment very quickly. Yeah. I don't know if he would have no, been no, flat-out okay. dead. But the thing is, he, he probably would have been sucked into space. Well, it sucked depends on if the there's vacuum. any air behind him. Like, because, okay, being the vacuum of space just draws okay, the air from behind you and pushes you a direction. Yeah. So Is the entire thing unpressurized? Nothing in it at all? I don't know. It's fucking magic. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> yeah, that's the explanation for it all. I could continue ranting, but in the end, it's magic. Yeah, all the kids Again, seem to have like this like desire to keep the magic secret. Did, was there like some scene before episode one where Miss Frizzle's like, Welcome to my classroom, I'm Mrs. Frizzle. Never speak of what happens in this classroom. That is a bizarre thing to bring up, because I do know from one episode that former students of her class are well aware of what happens in that classroom, but it doesn't <laughs> seem like Mr. Rule knows anything, and we don't meet any of the other teachers throughout the entire series, so it's difficult to explain. It seems mm -hmm. like only the kids know, and the adults are all oblivious. And, yeah, you know, like I said, it goes a little Welcome bit Welcome class, my name is Miss Frizzle. We will be teaching science <laughs> to 
magic. If you speak of the magic, the Krampus will come and eat your brain. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Episode 19 is wet all over, and this episode was adapted from the first book ever released in 1986. In this one, Arnold has prepared a model of the waterworks. However, to learn how the whole thing comes together, Miss Frizzle literally turns them into water. No, I actually um, kind of like the episode, because Arnold, like, it does, a, like, a double lesson tied in. It would have been very easy for the episode to be just, like, here's how water is purified, here's mm -hmm. how our water is treated, or, hey, here's how water works in nature, rain clouds and evaporation and running down mm -hmm. the ocean. Just either episode, it felt like something they would have done, but, like, they worked yeah. them both together. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of like that one. When it oh, comes to the lesson itself, this is pretty much one of the better episodes. I like that aspect. But then comes my ranting. One, why does Wanda take Arnold into the girls' washroom when she could have just gone alone or they could have gone to a neutral sink or they could have gone into the boys? I don't know. It, it had to be the girls because the plot. Number two, have you ever seen a school sink in either gender's bathroom to have a plug? Have or you ever not seen have one of those drain holes? Sink? You know the drain hole things? Like, it's yeah. really easy to make a sink not clog. You have to go out of your way to do it. They have a hole before it spills over. Or at least most things I've seen have them. Three, filling their cups and getting the water into the bucket is absolutely ridiculous. Wanda leaving Arnold all alone in the girls' washroom when she should have been the one staying with Arnold leaving with the bucket. And then Liz gets locked in there. The plug is still in the sink. The water's now overflowing. Somehow Liz is so strong that she manages to completely break the nozzle right off the sink so that she can't shut the water off. She's too short, so she can't reach the door to open it up. And are you trying to tell me that the entire entire time the class was off on their field trip that no other girl in the school had to take a piss. Did your school only have one set of bathrooms? I think so. Like, uh, God, yeah. Man, you live in a tiny town. <sighs> I, like, I live in a small town, but even my school had more than one bathroom. Jesus. Of course, by the end of the episode, how much of the bathroom has filled? The same girl that ran from Arnold earlier comes back, so she opens the door, the water just comes pouring out, and by pure luck, the front doors of the school are open, allowing the water to completely flow, and not a single person in the school has anything to say about what just happened. It's magic. They're probably pretty used to random weird shit going on They are in the same school as Miss Frizzle. And now we get to the heart of this whole thing, getting energized. Episode 23. Holy crap, this episode is ridiculous. The kids are operating a Ferris wheel at an amusement park. It's just a small fair, and the idea here is that everyone has started up with power except for their Ferris wheel, all because Carlos didn't plug it in in advance. So he does so, and the line just busts. So what are we going to do? Well, they could have just replaced the generator, got a new plug, which they attempt later anyway, and that one also fizzles out. So they have to find other forms of energy to power the Ferris wheel, and this is where the episode just gets really ridiculous. Ridiculous. Why these people that begin to riot in the lineup don't just take off to somewhere else at the fair and do something while they're waiting? They all came with produce in advance and started throwing stuff at Carlos, who's doing a whole lot of bad impressions, including his Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, they throw fruit at a child. This episode is really bad. In order to power the Ferris wheel, they do all the shit like launch rocks out of catapult and boil water yeah. to fucking make steam and shoot a cannon. I really like the concept because they're trying to demonstrate different forms of energy like kinetic energy like hydroelectric they're trying to show different forms of energy not just electricity but energy shit falls that's energy gravity pulling shit to the ground and it hitting the ground and making effect that is energy doing shit the movement of stuff stuff moving from place to place it's just trying to convey the idea it's done really badly. They should not have said, oh, the best example of showing how shit works is making fucking giant boulders fall on a Ferris wheel that people are in in order to make it go around. That's fucking retarded. They yeah. could have done that with literally anything. Like, I like the idea of building a Rube Goldberg device out of various things to display the transfer of energy and between different types, but the way they did it is really bad. 
And yeah, that that has to be the biggest rant for me out of the episode. It's just the whole boulder thing. It's silly enough that they're showing all these various kinds of energy to get the boulders up the mountain. But then once you see the first one come off of the apparatus and aim for the Ferris wheel, the way that it's drawn, it looks as if the boulder is actually flying past the Ferris wheel and about to hit the crowd. But no, by pure magic, it lands exactly where it has to in the seat adjacent. Like, this is a double-seater Ferris wheel. So the boulders are landing on the side closer to the mountain and the people are going to be on the opposite side. First of all, these boulders are falling about 50 plus feet. How are they not breaking the seats to begin with? How are they breaking the machine for people to get on and off? Magic. It's also the episode where we're introduced to Mikey and Mikey's most awkward line is hold on to your sombrero. None of them are wearing sombreros. Is it just a pun to express the fact that he's Hispanic? (laughs) Why'd he say that? I don't know. Continuing cold feet, Liz has decided to take a vacation to the fictional Herp Haven. (laughs) Yes, Daisy loves it. It's a facility where reptiles can come and be treated like dogs at a boarding whatever. Yeah. Go on. You have a manager of the place. He <laughs> creates wonderful meals for all these animals. Like he, in the episode, he makes a fly fricassee with a light bug sauce. <laughs> I'd like to point out that Herp Haven is an actual thing, if I remember right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a breeding box. Like, uh, it's a reptile breeding box, I think. We're, we're, I, we're I, breaking I, day. Yeah, it is an actual thing. Like I knew someone that had snakes. Uh, I, I know it is. It's just you really should not have those sorts of terms on a children's show because they tend to be more immature than I am. And they tend to you know, maybe miss that part about how they explain it and then maybe go to their parents and ask, Daddy, what's a herp? Phrasing people. Under construction, oh, this has to be my second big rant episode. Wanda has this little baby brother called William. They don't really state a whole lot about this kid, but he looks like he's four years old, even though he's represented as maybe two years old. He wears a diaper, just has a basic understanding of English. This kid is insanely strong for his size. Like, he is capable of stepping on their porta shrinker and breaking it. He can slam a bathroom door hard enough to make a bottle on the sink counter fall over. Also, I don't understand. PSA for gun violence. Is it? Or not gun violence, like gun safety is what it should have said. PSA for gun safety. (laughs) Lock up your guns, Miss Frizzle. Jesus Christ. Yeah, the idea of the episode is that they were supposed to go to a suspension bridge, but now they're locked in the bathroom and they have to get themselves out. Meanwhile, Wanda's mother is working for a magazine or something, and she likes to go hands-on, so to speak, with what she's doing articles for. So she has this baby alligator in their bathroom tub. Why would you keep that creature in there unattended? I I don't know. (laughs) Especially when you have a two-year-old around that just wanders, (laughs) does whatever the fuck he wants. Wanda Uh, has the worst parents. One time, the mother exits her office and goes through how much of the house with the phone in her hand, and the cord just keeps going. How long is that cord? (laughs) Toward the end of the episode, if you actually start to pay attention to the nursery in the house, there's alphabet wallpaper. So you start to read, and at one point you hit S, T, V, W, X. There's no U. (laughs) And this is supposed to be an educational program, so good job there. (sighs) Episode 33, Make a Rainbow, is regarding a light-themed pinball machine. It's actually a pretty fun episode. It was definitely my favorite of the ones we watched. It was the only one that really felt fully engaging. I don't really have much to say rant-wise on this one outside of Arnold as a ding-dong, literal on the ding, in that at some point he just keeps swaying back and forth, dinging to himself to try and make sure that Mr. Rule can't hear the dinging from the pinball machine. (laughs) 36 was another plant-oriented episode, and again, it has to do with Phoebe. I don't know what it is about them doing her and plants, but in this case, they're doing a play on Jack and the Beanstalk. This is one of the worst plays ever, by the way. The whole thing is narrated by Frizzle, and then the characters are just kind of there, standing around and doing their parts. But that's beside the point. My first question here was, would you try to feed your bean plant a Cheeto? That's what Keisha tries to do when she offers a cheesy-weezy to Phoebe. 
Another thing I had to question is, as the kids begin their field trip inside the plant, the ones that are already in costume for the play remain in costume. And for some reason, Carlos remains still wearing his stilts throughout the entire episode, unless he's in one of the suits. I just found that weird. Why is he still wearing the stilts? You couldn't take them off. Also, he's the worst giant I've ever seen. Like, they put the stilts on him, but they don't give him some kind of extra long (laughs) pants to give the illusion that he's a giant. I don't know. We also get the best line out of Wanda in the series in this episode, where she's complaining about this sticky white stuff that got in her mouth. It's the sugar that the plant is producing that it got all over her. (laughs) Oh, yeah, God. Wanda gets a lot of suggestive lines. Oh, yeah, like the episode we just saw before this, she was going on about, oh, oh, now I know how a tossed salad feels like. Crazy. Yep. 41 was cracks a yolk. We learned about how an egg is formed inside a chicken. Decent episode. This one kind of hits closer for me because my family did raise chickens for a few years. So it's kind of cool to see how the egg is developed. And, you know, now whenever I break an egg open, I kind of understand where that little white spot is and what it means. Episode 45 was about cells, and the whole thing is Arnold has been eating a fictional snack called seaweedies, which is a piece of carrot that's wrapped in seaweed. He's eaten so much of it that his skin has turned orange, and they have to learn why. The only thing I really question about this episode is what child would ever find that snack appealing? I think uh, Arnold just eats and everything. His thing, outside of being scared, is eating. The last episode to bring up is episode 50, Get Programmed. In this one, the kids have to program a very bizarre computer that has just arrived to Mr. Rule's office. They hook up several USB-style cords to this thing to various aspects of the school that controls the bells, the doors, the coffee machine in the teacher's lounge, the flagpole outside, the speaker system, and the office printer. And so Mikey makes his like second or third appearance and programs all of this massive gibberish of Roman letters and symbols to get it all to work and mayhem ensues from there. He takes the field trip into the computer to learn about it while the rest of them are trying to figure out what he's done and stop it. Ultimately, he just set it to repeat rather than do it once a day. I think one of the real downsides of that one is that they had their flagpole and coffee maker all computer ready in the mid-90s in uh, (laughs) public school. That's more than a bit of a stretch. So I have one rant about the show that when you really think about it, and that's if you take the show for what it is, consider the world to be what it is, magic is what it is, don't overthink the minutia, and just sort of think about it in the grand scale. Even then, Miss Frizzle is one of the world's greatest villains. She has magic. She has the ability to shrink people down, to go to other star systems, to examine things in a way that no human other than her and her class possibly could. She uses this to teach elementary school kids basic lessons. She doesn't teach the magic. She doesn't take this to brain surgeons. She doesn't take it to physicists. Point is that her withholding her magic, her abilities from the world, keeping it secret, not using it in a more appropriate way, is probably the most evil thing that we've seen outside of a pure evil character in any of the shows we've watched. Is it evil? It's definitely it is. not... Every day know. that someone dies. Every day someone dies of a blood know. clot, an aneurysm, because she didn't shrink down a scientist to help them develop something to clear those. I don't know if that's... Is the day that that that's definitely dies. not the best use of your power, but, like, if not doing something... It is, to is me, not... evil, and I think we can agree that, at minimum, it's extremely smug and condescending towards <laughs> humanity as a whole. Oh, mm-hmm. I agree. It is where I disagree with is the word evil. If you were to put it into that logic, yes, there's better uses of her powers, but evil? I don't know. Evil is like, if she were using her powers to actively cause harm, actively hide information, actively uh, starve people. I don't know. She turns a blind eye to it. At minimum, she turns a blind eye like, to I it. Like, I have the power right that, now. But I have the power right now to donate my $1,500 in my bank account to help a person not be homeless. I'm not doing that. I'm not making the world a better place with that. Instead, I'm going to do something else. Yours isn't the only one in the world. You don't have the only shrinking, magically, <laughs> like, space-faring school bus in the world. She's got something very, very unique, very special there. And she is, I think a, a lot of people would say, squandering her gift. 
Yeah, I would agree. Education that, is uh, never something I would look down upon. I think, but I, I think man, this is very much a. Uh, I honestly, I think we're splitting hairs over the terminology. I think exactly. I well, conveyed it's also, it's my meaning. That too. Is it evil to not help if you can? If it's not evil, then she's a jerk. Oh, definitely, I agree there. But like, my thought here is just where's the line? Because I don't know if not. It, you can't find the line without a definition, and I'm yeah, not exactly. here to define it. Yeah, but I think my point stands that she is between a massive jerk and very evil, depending on your point of view on the definition and where the line is drawn. I get it, it's for the purpose of storytelling, but man, you really think you could have thrown in a line about her helping NASA at some point, her helping some chemist discover some new reaction, something? You know, I don't know. Something? Yeah, maybe her powers are just limited to what she is capable of knowing herself. Still, she could take people down yeah. and let people discover. Yeah. She's letting the kids discover on their own most of the time. Yeah, I get your argument. Yeah, it's... That's my one rat. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay next up music and art we could start with the theme song please uh, oh yeah yeah it's it's very iconic it's sung by little richard the contents of the intro are very nice basically everything that you see in the intro occurs in the episodes in some way they cover a lot of ground yeah that's one of the things i was most impressed about first of all the intro theme is probably the best part of the show for me it's a great theme it's very jazzy feel good energetic the intro animation is also quite good but it doesn't outshine the animation of the episodes terribly like some shows do but the song man the song is terrific and the fact that they actually do all of the events that are sung about in one episode or another given a little bit of artistic license yeah that's pretty amazing yeah, I like that. A lot of intros make use of recycled art, and it works really well for this. Like you said, it, they're all lessons that are covered. The intro itself is really good. It's very memorable. It's very directly to the point. If there's only one little minor thing to be said about the intro, is that at the end, they sing about being baked into a pie, whereas in the actual episode, they're baked into a cake. But, you know, they have to actually, get their phrasing. Actually, if there's <laughs> one thing to say about it, I don't think splitting hairs between pies and cakes when the guy's got so little to work with is that big a deal. <laughs> I think the problem is the very beginning before the song. Beep, beep, seatbelts, everyone! Okay, guys, show of hands, how many of you have been on a public school bus that had seatbelts? Now, I know in some districts they are required by law. I have never been in a school bus with seatbelts. Never. Uh, nope, never. Public so, or school, haven't seen them. Yeah. Then again, so, I did not have very yes. good experiences on school buses, so maybe I'll block out most of those memories. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think you would remember buckling up, yeah. right? No, yeah, there's no seatbelts. Uh, <laughs> Obviously. There's no seatbelts. Making a seat I mean, buckling your seatbelt is an important thing to do, and I think especially that's the, 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 to teach point. kids. But there's no seatbelts on a school bus. You think they would at least have gotten that basic idea down? Is that what makes it magical? Probably not. Yeah. What well, I was gonna say about music, it has to do with the director of the show. The music in the first season is a lot of classical. And they kind of sh shy away from that. And one thing I was really disappointed with in the music is they used all that classical music so early in the show. And then when they get to the episode about bees, they fail to use Fly of the Bumblebee. <laughs> it bugged me. That's it. Oh, unintentional, but... <laughs> Carlos. Carlos! <laughs> Mojo. <laughs> No, I honestly didn't notice the music much. I was too yeah. for a lot of this. I neither did I. I, I actually, didn't care. other than the, the they they go to just the to more generic, repetitive used music. I'll f try to find some mm -hmm. samples and I'll throw in here. I'm sure it but doesn't like, matter. It's super forgettable. The art's not bad. I wouldn't say bad. It's not good either. It's very very bland. It's very par for mid '90s show. All the characters, except for the bus, Liz, and Miss Frizzle, are all very bland, including the kids. They're all kind of like just generic looking kids, and I guess that's kind of the point. I guess the only thing that really stuck out to me for the art could be from the it Works Out episode, where around the teacher athlon, there's how many people in the stands? Like, there's got to be at least a few hundred based on how they've drawn it. But all the people are just little pastel blobs of heads and torsos and limbs. 
And now, this is common for cartoons, even when we've talked about, say, Ruby, and how in the first season every other character in the background is just black. So these characters are just kind of there, they're static. We're hearing commotion from the stands, but we're not seeing anybody. It's just a mess of random little bits of color. Even when they do close-ups around the final event, when Frizzle and Sinew are running up the steps, it looks like these people are still just kind of static and staring forward, rather than the people that are right there next to the seats turning and looking up at them racing up the stairs it's all very bland in that but outside of that the art is good the characters are not much to look at a lot of the times the places they go are interesting and vibrant and colorful and cool interesting representations of what the hell they're trying to demonstrate little details like the shit on the side of fucking arnold's colon yes that is a word (laughs) i said the details the details But they do a good job at trying to add little details and stuff like that to help enhance the learning educational side of it. But a lot of the time, they're drawn really cheaply, I want to say. It's just, you could tell a lot of it's done on a budget and copy and paste. One thing I did want to say about the art is that this show does have its share of animation errors. The one I can think of off the top of my head is the episode where Tim makes the model airplane and they shrink down to fly inside of it. The school bus turns into an airplane various types of flying machines at different points. One of the airplanes has like its wings overlaid on top of the school bus. You know, it's supposed to be in the background, but instead it's like, it's a layering issue. There's various things like that. It's just kind of poorly done. By the time that someone noticed it, they're like, well, fuck, that episode's on the air. It's too late now. Having actual children play the kids, well, I think was beneficial to them because while the acting wasn't great, the voices and connotation was kind of on point. And I think we've already mentioned Lily Tomlin and her performance already. It needs to be said here in the sound area. Lily Tomlin gives an outstanding performance, probably the best of her career. The show would be a shadow of itself if anyone else would have been cast in the role. Yeah, she really does kind of carry it. It's just hard to imagine a magic school bus without her as Miss Frizzle. Has this show inspired anything outside of a few parodies that we've seen? It's hard to say, because PPS has been in a rough spot, and I think that's the real core of children's programming right now. It's also harder to get cartoons out there. I don't think TV wants cartoons as much right now. I hate to say it didn't inspire anyone, because I think any kind of educational programming may have uh, inspired people to be scientists and whatnot. As far as entertainment, I can't pinpoint anything. I'm far from an expert, but I'd like to think there are fewer opportunities now than there were when this show was created, and maybe that's why we haven't seen as many inspirations come out. I know what I'd like to think is one thing that inspired it, at least in some degree, is Fred Rogers. He was a champion of children's public television for a great many years, and in some way, shape, or form, he definitely inspired the Magic School Bus. I saw a parallel to the show Arthur. I find it kind of sad that today's television has diminished to what it is. I attribute this to around 2003 when reality programming started to become a thing and I really saw a massive decline in television. Like the episodes that we were watching days were recorded off of TLC. TLC is a shell of its former self today. Like do they even have educational programming anymore? It's called the Learning Channel. I don't think you can learn anything from it anymore. It's mostly reality programming. And something that used to air the Magic School Bus in Bill Nye is now airing Honey Boo Boo. Yeah, uh, you've lost me. (laughs) It's funny you mentioned 2003. That was the year Fred Rogers died. I miss how good television was in the 80s and 90s, especially in this regard to educational programming. Because today, really all you have is Sesame Street, which is still going. But outside of that, I can't really think of anything. See, I don't know much about today's educational programming, but there's been okay educational programs since Magic School Bus. I don't really remember all that much educational programming what I watched as a kid. Maybe stuff like Reading Rainbow and Captain Planet. Those are both examples of stuff that came out around the same time frame, but there's also stuff since. Like, my younger sister was super into Blue's Clues. Oh, yeah. There, yeah, there's definitely been there's, stuff that there, came yeah. out after it, but... Yeah, it's more of the hip thing to do to be profitable rather than educational. 
some shows such as this one have received sequels or reboots in some fashion that have been more or less online exclusive it's like is that why it's so dumbed down on television is that they're trying to focus on the fact that a lot of parents these days for some reason are buying their kids younger and younger electronics that allow them to do stuff online so programs such as the magic school bus and reading rainbow are getting these sequel series but they're online exclusive I think that's just the nature of entertainment. It's, we're going way outside the scope of this show, but mm -hmm. yeah. a brief discussion of entertainment in general is to be expected for this. I think the nature of entertainment in general and making sure that the educational programs reach children when they have to be cutting edge, basically. They have to be right there on the cusp. Otherwise, they're going to miss a generation. It's exactly. going to be too old-fashioned. It's, it's just a matter of less kids are sitting in front of the TV nowadays. They're sitting at a computer... Mm or a tablet, or a phone. If you want to put out educational content and you want a lot of kids to see it, yes, kids will see it on TV. Kids are still watching Sesame Street, right? But if you want a lot of kids to see it, you're going to put it on Netflix or YouTube. That's where kids watch stuff now. Like, my little brother doesn't watch stuff as it airs. He never has. His entire life. TV shows for him are, okay, this is the date it came out. If I if it was important enough to me to watch it, then I'll do it. But otherwise, I will watch it on demand. Or I will watch it online on YouTube. Or I will watch it on Netflix, right? That's just the nature of it nowadays. It's just different. Mm -hmm. You have to be accessible to the audience you're trying to teach. So I think that is the major reason that we see a lot of children's educational programming taken off TV and put onto online services. I just wish it was more accessible to all kids. And uh, I'm going to speak about that a bit later when we talk about the sequel specifically. I wonder if Data's line from that one episode of The Next Generation about television no longer being a popular form of entertainment in 2040 actually becomes true. Probably. We're on schedule. Yeah. TV's <laughs> been, cable companies have been hurting for years. What do we have for supplemental media outside of the video games and the books? Yeah. That's it. Right? I think there's, there's probably it, toys, but that's merch. There's probably some audiobooks or something. It's probably hmm. some educational toys or something like that. Learn to read with the Magic School Bus. I can't imagine much else. Uh, it certainly was that uh, sit down and collect all the students sort of action figure type thing. It didn't spawn any comic books. There are over a hundred books and over a dozen video games. Really? Uh, that's because Cartoon is the supplemental media. I suppose so. <laughs> Pretty much. Most of those video games are on PC. I think there was one on Genesis. There's one on the Nintendo DS. And then there's this thing called the Sega Pico. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It's a uh, like, kid's toy laptop type thing that will play certain media. And there's a few Magic School Bus titles of some sort on that. It blows me away that they were still making Magic School Bus stuff after DS had released. Me too. Never doubt nostalgia. Someone out there bought it. The show's setting, which we didn't bring up, is in the fictional Walkerville Elementary School. They don't exactly state where it is. I believe there's an episode where they talk about the phone number for the school, and the area code would put it in, somewhere in the Chicago suburbs. There is an actual Walkerville Elementary School in Walkerville, Michigan. Do they do anything Magic School Bus themed there? Who knows? And with that, I believe we're moving on to the sequel. The Magic School Bus Rides Again is a Netflix-only animated series that continues the next school year after summer break, I believe. Or maybe hmm. after winter break? I'm not sure, because they're yeah, in the same after class. after some kind of break. Is the entirety of the first run of Magic School Bus supposed to take place in one school year? Maybe even half a school year if it's the same school year and just after the winter break, summer break, I don't know. Whenever they change grades. I guess we're going to start following Simpsons rules here on time in that even though the holiday has happened, they come back and they're in the same grade. Sure. <laughs> Valerie Frizzle has decided to retire or that she is moving on to become a professor at another location. She brings in her younger sister, Fiona Frizzle, voiced by Kate McKinnon from Saturday Night Live. I know you guys watched episode one and two. Yes. Yep. I watched episode one and then skipped ahead to episode 12. My first impression is the intro song is a lot worse. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not going to say they didn't have a talented enough singer. I'm not saying that, oh, it's Little Richard. How can you compete with him? No, it's just worse. For whatever reason, it's worse. 
Yeah, like they could have had Little Richard return into a cover of his own song, but instead they got Lynn manuel Miranda from the group Hamilton to do a cover, and it's not as catchy. For me, it's definitely worse. It's not as good, not as catchy, it's not as iconic. And you have to be a really good cover to be better than the original, in my opinion. And this just falls flat of that. I, I don't think it's shit, but it's not an improvement. If you're going to do worse, why not use the original? Uh, okay, so going into the animation is a very different style. I can see how that would put a lot of people off, but it's much more modern. And I prefer the sharpness and especially the animation to it. You have a lot more freedom of animation in the backgrounds and in smaller objects with this new animation style. And I, having seen a little bit of it, I do like the new animation style quite a bit compared to the older style. It's not as, I don't know, cozy as the older style, but it is much more lively, energetic. Yeah, I like both. The old style has that old cell animation feel. You know, like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. And I like them both. I don't think one's inherently better or worse than the other. I don't feel that passionately about the difference in art style. In it. But it definitely is different, and it's upset some people. Likewise, they've done some stylistic changes to some of the characters and such. Phoebe has moved back to her old school that she never shut up about. <laughs> and they have a new girl to replace her who is new to the class named Geodi. I actually like her a lot better. Geodi's a pretty cool character all in all from what little sample I saw of her. She's sort of the problem solver of the class. She fits in quite well. I think, I'm going to be honest here, though she is playing a very different character, she's playing Miss Rizzle's sister, Kate McKinnon had very big shoes to fill playing Miss Rizzle. I don't think she did the job she needed to do. I think her acting is not really good enough. Even if she's not playing the same character, she didn't do that good of a job in my opinion. To me, her history as a stand-up comedian, as a, yeah, I suppose as a comedian in general, seemed to play into her acting a bit more than it should have. I think the warmth and the heart just wasn't present in at least the episodes I saw. It's like she's trying too hard to replicate Lily. And yeah, maybe have that's a, it. Like, she's trying to do an impersonation. Yeah, she wants to be Valerie Frizzle, but she's not making her own identity. That is the most upsetting thing about the sequel. It seems like it's taking a more modern, more fleshed out approach to the ideas they're trying to teach. And for the most part, I think they do a better, more cohesive job. Not that the other ones were all necessarily bad at their lessons, but from the sample uh, I've seen, I'm more impressed with them. I'll get into that in just a moment, but to rewind a bit, what well, we mentioned that Valerie Frizzle is a professor now. She is not teaching the class, and she is traveling the world without Liz with a new sidekick, some sort of orangutan thing. She's on some sort of magical <laughs> what the scooter new sidekick? thing. Well, the interesting thing about that is that they have brought back the producer segments, but the original Miss Frizzle does them. And I think that's a stroke of genius. I like it, but at the same time, maybe it's just because she couldn't commit to doing the amount her old part would take compared to just doing the producer segments. But like, man, you had the original there. Why not just have Miss Frizzle instead of this knockoff crappy impersonation? Like, I, I don't know. That was the most upsetting thing about the sequel to me. Is that yeah, the we mentioned that yeah, Frizzle is the heart and soul of the show, and replacing her with a different teacher, even if it's her sister, really doesn't feel the same. Yeah, and if uh, you take her and you still have her there at the end of the episodes and stuff, it just kind of rubs salt in the wound. It's like, hi, we replaced her, but she's still around. No one begrudges them replacing Scrooge McDuck and the new DuckTales. And I'm sure no one would have begrudged a Magic School Bus for replacing it with a totally different character if Lily didn't want to come back. If they were so dead shit on the show coming and they tried, it'd still be a disappointment, probably. You know, because like we said, she carried the show, but at that point, it wouldn't have been as insulting. But no, they kept her around and still replaced her. I don't know. It's just kind of off-putting. So, I mentioned earlier that I watched a different other episode than you other than the second. I watched episode 12. As it so happens, I randomly chose the episode that has the same lessons as Gets Energized. The same lessons about wind and solar power. And I can confirm that they teach that lesson so much better. It's called Monster Power, I believe. Episode 12 of Season 1 of Magic School Bus Rides Again. Arna watches some scary movie about a smog monster that's defeated by light. He's terrified the monster's real. Their uh, field trip is actually a real field trip for once. They just go out to camp in the woods. Arnold is so scared of this monster that he takes all the lights with him from class, grabs all the lamps off the desks and stuff. When he gets there, he realizes he has nowhere to plug them in, so they make a gas-powered generator. Just magically pull it out of the bus because they can. It's a magic bus. 
He gets worried that the burning gas will create fuel for the monster, so he has to stop and find alternative energy sources. And he goes he's through. He's not afraid it's going to burn keep... down the forest they're camping in. Not at all. He's not scared <laughs> at all. Smokey is not featured in this, but he goes through this motion of using Keisha's bicycle as a way to power the lights and run the generator. When he gets tired, he tries to find other sources, so he finds wind power and then uh, hydroelectric power, and he ends up setting the wheels from Keisha's bicycle to become a windmill and a water wheel for those, and connects both of those at the same time to power the generator overnight and create the light. It is a much, much better structured story. Just from my brief description, I think you guys can agree, it's a much better story. It fits better. They get to the point of the lessons. Yeah, it well, includes it's, the it's other not kids. Harder. It's not hard to be better than that. that episode. It's not hard, but if this is the standard, I'm going to say the Magic School Bus Rides again. The worst episodes are probably going to be on par with the best episodes of the original. So as long as they can find a way to get Kate McKinnon to have some heart in her performance on season two, a lot of children are going to be very pleased with this one. Well, I say a lot of children, but I'm now getting to my big problem with the new one. It's Netflix only. The audience is very, very limited. And I feel like Netflix, hopefully in just a few years, will be generous and offer this series as a free sample to anyone who goes to their site, not just signed up viewers. I think that would be a wonderful charitable thing to do to yeah. uh, give out this educational show. And uh, yeah, hopefully the show finds a way to reach audiences that don't even have internet connections in the future because yeah, well, otherwise it's missing well, the point. Totally, absolutely outside the scope of this podcast. And like maybe we should just make a discussion cast at some point just talking about education cartoons. But to be honest, works. I've had quite enough of this show. I'd like to not do too many education shows in the future. At least space them out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Thanks. Yeah. I, I know. But anyway, what I was going to say is there, this is totally outside the scope of the podcast, but there has been talk about various, and some countries are already working on it, making internet considered a basic human right. I'd like to see it as a utility, but other than that, I'd like to see some schools get discs or whatnot to, to have kids viewing class or something like that. Just to have them shipped out for free or something, because I think that would be helpful, because not every kid is fortunate enough to have internet access, and certainly not every family has Netflix. Oh yeah, one last thing. Tim's redesign really freaked me out. I, I didn't recognize him as the same character. Yeah. Agreed. He's not as black, and he's White got black. a very different Ooh. hairstyle. Like, he could have been a lighter shade, but man, that kid grew a lot of hair over break. <laughs> and changed his color of hair significantly. Keisha had a ponytail, and now she's got like two little puffy horns coming she's off like her head. She's like Sailor Moon, but without the pigtails. Okay, yeah, okay. There, there's a good example. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, um, final thoughts? And, okay, so for me, I'm just going to say it. This show is only good in small doses for nostalgia. I don't think adults are going to get much out of watching the full thing, even if they watched it originally. I don't think kids are going to get much out of this show in general because a lot of the lessons are kind of old, and I think it looks maybe a little dated for them to get into. Plus, they have the new show to check out, which is probably at least as good, all things considered. So I just don't think this is much a show for anyone these days. We just need more educational programming for kids these days that is on par with what we used to get when we were younger and less of what makes television so bad and not make it so exclusive to something which limits your audience. Like, I don't have Netflix. I would like to sh check out this show more. And whenever a different medium comes along, I will. But for now, I don't have access to it. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Um, my final thoughts on the Magic School Bus. There's definitely some nostalgia attached to it. I don't hate the show, but I don't love it. I'm very indifferent to it. But even then, I can't help but have a little nostalgia. And it, my, I'm very conflicted about this show. I think that it's not very useful as an educational tool anymore. Yes, some of the episodes, like the, the Rain Cycle one and uh, the programming one, I think they'd work. But it's just, like you said, Deus, too dated. The same thing that makes me like that old cell animation style feels old and dated to kids nowadays, right? And if you want to make educational programming work for kids nowadays, you have to aim it toward them. You don't want the kids being disinterested in it because it looks old and uninteresting. It doesn't look new and flashy or new and as elaborate as newer competing cartoons. So I think the Magic School Bus, the original, is dated and that it's not going to be useful as an educational cartoon much anymore. 
but that's nice. I'm glad it exists. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there. That, it sounds like you, Air Hammer, that got a lot out of it. So yeah, mm -hmm. I guess I'll leave it at that. How do you want to leave this one out? Like I take guess chances, we'll just... make mistakes. Get messy. I've actually said that line to somebody, so it, it lived with me. It's a good line. It's a good line, but it needs context. Otherwise, you don't know what teen friends. <laughs>